Welcome to another episode of the Bandage Podcast, a weekly wrap-up of the most trending healthcare news. Each week, join me and my co-host Alex Ross as we'll discuss the latest in healthcare, health IT, and compliance. In this week's episode, we discuss the reversal of diabetes, updates on the COVID-19 vaccine, and health benefits of chili peppers. Let's wrap things up. This is episode 59 for the week of November 16th. I'm Matt Moneypenny. And I'm Alex Ross. Before we get started, our diagnosis code of the week is W29.3, contact with powered garden and outdoor hand tools and machinery. You know, interestingly enough, this is something that happened to me this week. Oh, is it? Yeah. Mm. Uh Uh-huh. Long story short, my neighbor is super friendly and super helpful. Shout out, uh, Alex's neighbor. But not... Yeah, but not always the most coordinated. Yeah, let's let's put it that way. Or or he he doesn't really pay attention very well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, he means well, but it doesn't end well. Let me give you the long story. So, oh. my leaf pickup is coming up. At, at least I thought it was because everybody's raking their leaves out to the road. Yeah, and so I was out raking my leaves to the road, thinking, oh, I got to get this done before this weekend so that they can pick them up. Um. Interestingly enough, my leaf pickup is not until December 9th, so that's fun. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm out there raking my leaves, and my neighbor has rented this, like, push leaf blower. Yeah. I mean, it's this huge contraption. that's It looks like a lawnmower, but it's got a a massive air outlet, and it's just blowing leaves ridiculously far. It's the Home Depot special. Um, Yeah. It doesn't look like he's got it really under control, though. And I'm raking my leaves and he sees me raking my leaves. And I guess he thought he was going to try to be helpful because he just went straight from his property straight onto mine and all the way across. And um, I I was kind of blown away by it, yeah. literally, <laughs> <laughs> by how powerful this thing was. I mean, he ran he went right past me and. You would be surprised how how strong the air coming out of those things is oh, because yeah. it swept me off my feet literally yeah. onto the ground into the leaf pile. I'm still picking sticks out of my hair from that experience. Wow! Um, but I, I of course had to go get checked. Very out traumatic. It was very painful. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds I, like uh, you know what I have to say about that. That blows. <laughs> I- I think from now on, I'm going to stick to just a leaf rake. I, I think that's probably the better option. Did you tell your neighbor to leave you alone? Yeah, exactly. Leave me be. <laughs> leave me be. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a great trip, but I hope to not see him next fall. <laughs> and with that. <laughs> Let's get into the news. First up, we have one reversal of type 1 diabetes. A precision medicine treatment that involves correcting an underlying genetic mutation led to the reversal of a case of type 1 diabetes. A study focused on a male patient who was diagnosed with classical autoimmune presentation of type 1 diabetes. He also suffered from recurring respiratory infections. Researchers found that the patient had a harmful gene mutation which is known to drive respiratory infections and various autoimmune diseases including type 1 diabetes. Providers treated the patient with ruxolitinib a year after starting this therapy and close to two years after his diabetes diagnosis, he was able to discontinue daily injections of insulin and still maintain normal blood glucose levels. I'm curious to hear which disease they were actually treating. Um, Was the reversal of this type 1 diabetes, was this just a, a byproduct of treating the underlying genetic condition? Or were they actually targeting uh, the type 1 diabetes, trying to reverse it? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I wonder I if it was like a, oh, look, we, we accidentally cured this disease kind of deal. Well, right. That, that's not necessarily a surprising, oh, wow, how did we manage to do that? But like you cure the, or, or at least treat in some way, the condition that's causing the type 1 diabetes. Yeah, right. So... Maybe it's to be expected that something like that could happen. I, I have a feeling that the doctor had a conversation with him that went something along the lines of, it might do this, but probably not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, don't well, want to get your hopes up. One of the lead, I, one of the lead authors, Dr. Sophia Ebenezer, said, this case is quite fascinating. So, 
you know, take that. Exactly. So you know that it's you know it's that it is fascinating. fascinating. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. It should be noted um, that a- according to these doctors, this appears to be the first example of a type one diabetic patient who has been able to completely reverse their insulin dependence. Yeah, which is so a big deal. This is not deal. something that normally happens. And like I said, they probably had that conversation that this is probably not going to happen. Yeah. In fact, for all we knew, it was probably impossible. Um, so it looks like that this is pretty promising, and maybe it gives us a new attitude when we're going to treat diseases like type 1 diabetes uh, about how we might be able to affect it by treating other underlying conditions. Mm-hmm. It's a classic case of you were trying to solve this, but ended up solving this instead. I feel like that's how a lot of medical advancements happen. It's, it's an accident. Yeah, you're doing I think you're right. some kind of test, and then you're like, oh, hey, look what I, oh, I discovered penicillin. So and so had type <laughs> 1 diabetes, and it's now solved. So that's great. Now we get to figure out exactly why that was able to work, and that's the fun part. Yes. But good for that guy. Next up, will Pfizer finish their vaccine first? Pfizer's experimental COVID-19 vaccine was found to be more than 90% effective. This news comes from an analysis of a study involving 43,538 volunteers, 42% of whom had, quote, diverse backgrounds. Each participant got two injections 21 days apart. The analysis compared the number of cases among the volunteers getting the vaccine to a similar-sized group of volunteers who had a placebo injection. The FDA set a minimum effectiveness bar at 50%. This is the first COVID-19 vaccine in development to have data showing that it has exceeded that mark. The agency has informed manufacturers that it wants at least two months of follow-up data from at least half of the volunteers. This is because the most dangerous side effects from the vaccine occur within two months of getting the final injection. It's good news. Then I think another thing to note here is that this vaccine requires it to be stored in negative 94 degrees. So, which is also negative 70 because, you know, I'm a math wizard and I totally didn't look it up on my computer while you were talking about the story. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's an interesting, interesting takeaway too, because that's, that's pretty cold. Absolutely. And, and that's not normal like freezer that anybody has. Since yeah, around. no. Yeah. If I remember correctly, there were You're some uh, vaccines that were being tested that it could be stored in just a, a normal freezer and be okay, but these ones required a yeah. specific colder environment. Yeah, your uh, Samsung smart fridge is not going to handle it. You might be able to watch TV on it, but you definitely can't get the freezer down to <laughs> negative 70 degrees Celsius. No, no probably not. <laughs> But this is but good then, news. I mean, we always, it's like when we first, when COVID first happened, we talked about it like every week up until quarantine and then we got tired of it. And then every month or so we have another story about COVID. So whether good right. or for bad, and obviously this is a good one. So hopefully um, everything works out, you know, the testing goes through and gets accepted and then we can get it distributed to people so that we don't have to worry about this as a pandemic anymore. Well, I'll tell you, this year when it looked like football was not going to be a thing, I had to find a, a different thing to do with the $20 that I normally would have put into a fantasy football league. Mm. Uh, and so what I actually did is I played fantasy coronavirus vaccine and <laughs> invested in the stocks of yeah. different companies. Uh, it looks like I'm going to do about as well on that opportunity as I usually do in fantasy football, uh, meaning I'm coming in dead last. But yeah, right. <laughs> it was course. still a fun experience. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to get better at drafting your vaccine companies. That's all it is. Exactly. Well, to be fair, it's my first time ever playing COVID-19 vaccine fantasy football yeah, well, league. I mean, game. as someone who is an expert in the <laughs> COVID vaccine <laughs> Fantasy football leagues for years, let me tell you. (laughs) For years? Do you know something I don't? (laughs) Oh, there's multiple COVIDs. (laughs) Next up, foods to spice up your health benefits. Ah, Researchers found that chili peppers may significantly reduce a person's risk of dying from heart disease or cancer. The researchers looked at almost 5,000 studies from leading global health databases, which looked at chili pepper consumption among 
570,000 people in the United States, China, and India. They compared individual health outcomes of those who ate chili peppers regularly with those who rarely or never ate them. The researchers found a 26% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, a 23% reduction in cancer mortality, and a 25% reduction in all-cause mortality in the people who regularly ate chili peppers. The exact reason to explain the findings are currently unknown, and more evidence from randomized controlled studies is needed to confirm the preliminary findings. Well, they better start making room on the shelf in the Walmart supplement aisles, because uh, pretty soon it's going to be chili pepper capsules. Yeah, true, true. I think they already have cayenne, don't they? They probably do. I think they do. It's supposed to be good I mean, for they've your, got just about your digestive anything in capsule form. Yeah. If you're ever in the spice aisle and you're like, oh no, they're out of stock on garlic powder <laughs> yeah. or, or literally anything, just head over to the supplement oh, aisle. Oh no, I need some. <laughs> oh, here we go. I need some garlic seafood capsules. stock. <laughs> Better go get some fish oil pills and huh, make a nice that's soup. That's right. <laughs> bouillon is out of stock. Let me go get some bouillon cap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a I'm good point. I'm really interested, though, to see why this is the case. Yeah. What What is it about hot peppers that makes them have a good, right? A, at least seemingly a good effect? Yes. Now, granted, this may be something a little bit deeper. It may be the type of people who enjoy hot food right, right. maybe that might be the difference maybe they're just healthier lifestyles or something like that not necessarily that but you know maybe they have a different metabolism or something i, I don't necessarily think it's the peppers themselves that are causing this i think it you need to give chili be... peppers some credit here alex <laughs> 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 i don't want you to disparage chili peppers reputations okay you're right. You're right. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm going to go invest in my chili pepper capsule business. Yeah. And now that I think about it, everybody should be using them mm-hmm. regularly. A hundred percent. Definitely. There's, it's, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, right? So, or in this case, the, the proof pepper. Is in the pepper. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't, it, it's, they don't really know. They said it themselves that the uh, findings are currently unknown as to why this happened. So it could just be like a, just the the fact that it was 5,000 people that just didn't have a high risk of heart disease or cancer to begin with. And they also just liked eating spicy food. I mean, who knows? I I suppose it could be a complete coincidence. My thoughts is that it probably has something to do uh, maybe genetically, Mm -hmm. because we know that people can be genetically predisposed to things like bitter tastes. Yeah. Right. Some people like those. Some of them don't. Because some people, uh, it, it's overpowering. It's it's strong, too strong for them, and some people enjoy that taste. So maybe something similar is going on with hot and spicy things, but that is this like relates a, to some other condition genetically that that causes the other effects. It's not eating the peppers that does it. You know how they say that Cheerios lowers your cholesterol. Uh, that's what I've heard. Or is it heart disease? Something like that. Yeah, lowers cholesterol. That's what it is. Do you think that like Buffalo Wild Wings is going to make a chili pepper flavor and say that it, you know, lowers chance of cancer and heart oh, disease? I think that they would have a hard time getting away with that uh, because you've got to get a gold stamp from your friends over at the FDA to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, I know, and, uh, right? I, I have a feeling that the FDA is going to be like, yeah, but I'm pretty sure that the greasy fried chicken part kind of cancels out any benefits that you might get from the spice. <laughs> hey, like I said, I mean, there is a study, Alex. <laughs> yeah, that, hey. give beat ups a chance. I think there's a case to be made. I think there's a case to be made. You know what? Maybe I'm going to open up a health food store and it's just going to be like hot fried chicken, hot. Oh, the only flavor is chili pepper. Flaming hot Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, let's get to our next segment. B R E A C H, Breach Patrol. It's a breach! All of the latest cybersecurity breaches. Welcome to Breach Patrol. You know what we do here. First up, we have a prestigious company wouldn't expose millions of guests' data. Hotel software provider Prestige Software exposed personal data of millions of guests worldwide after misconfiguration of an Amazon Web Service Bucket. 
Prestige software is used by many on the top online travel agent sites such as Expedia. The misconfigured S3 bucket contained over 10 million individual log files dating back to 2013. But the total number affected could be even greater since some logs contained information for multiple members of a single booking. Leaked data includes names, email addresses, national ID numbers, phone numbers, and credit card details of hotel guests. The leaked information could have offered malicious third parties a trove of data to commit identity fraud, launch phishing attempts, and hijack and change booking details. So far, there's no evidence of data being stolen. Um, so this has been going on for seven years, <laughs> 2013 to 2020. <laughs> Jeez. Well, well, the file that got exposed goes back seven years. Yeah. Not necessarily the exposure right. itself. Well, I mean, kind of. <laughs> it's a living document, so kind <laughs> of. <laughs> it's a living document. <laughs> um, yeah. So break it down. I mean, this is like your standard thing that happens, right? So. AWS is growing in popularity. A lot of companies are transitioning to it because of the stuff that it offers is awesome. It has a great uh, infrastructure behind it. But there also comes with it a little bit of a learning curve, right? And I feel like that's what kind of happened here is whoever configured it wasn't really familiar with AWS per se. So they made a mistake. Absolutely. Yep. And, and I think we've seen this exact scenario play out with a number of other companies. Um, Perhaps there needs to be some kind of change on Amazon's side, at the very least, to make it a little more obvious when you're making something that's going to be accessible publicly, right? Yeah. Maybe we need to add an extra confirmation check mark. Yes, I want this to be available for anybody. To the to world. <laughs> right, or the, maybe exactly. the developer was like, I can show you the world. Shining, shimmering, <laughs> splendid. I can show the world this. That's for I sure. can show the world this. <laughs> it does sound like there is, I mean, a ridiculous amount of information in this. Yeah. It is like the hacker's dream breach. It's mm -hmm. got everything. It's got names and addresses and emails and credit cards and phone it's numbers. It's almost like I a mean, paid promotion. Exactly. Call now think, and get another 2,500 contacts. With that much information, you could almost do anything. You could use the credit cards maliciously, and then you could call them and say, hey, somebody's using your credit card maliciously. Please give me your password so mm -hmm. that I can fix it. Mm -hmm. I got a pen and paper. <laughs> Keep going. What else you got? Yeah. What else can I do with this data? <laughs> so it, it looks like they, they're saying that they don't think any data was stolen, so it's seems to be that they found it but yeah keep an eye out if you've used any prestige software in the last number of uh months next up i prefer my potatoes mashed but my passwords hashed technology and culture news website mashable announced that personal data was discovered in a leaked database posted on the internet the database contained information from readers who made use of the platform's social media sign-in feature the media said that a hacker known for targeting websites and apps was responsible for the breach, but the suspect hasn't been named. Leaked data includes names, locations, email addresses, genders, IP addresses, and links to social media profiles of users. All affected accounts have been disabled as a precaution and no password data is believed to have been taken. Mashable warns users to be cautious of phishing attempts. It's the after attacks that always get you. Yep, there's the first attack, then the phishing attack. It's usually, I mean, that's what happens. And then people fall for the phishing attack, and then they end up losing all their data that's actually important, right? Right. And and oftentimes, it's not even the same malicious actor who's doing both. Mm -hmm. One person will, will steal this data because that's their skill yeah, set, and then they will team. sell it to another uh, to try and fish you. So Yes. It's kind of like, As we go it's like a bait and tackle the... store, right? So the first guy is a bait and tackle store, and then the fisherman comes first... in and takes the worms, which is your data. No, no and then... the first guy's the bait guy. The second yeah, guy so I tackles said... you. Oh, oh, <laughs> right. My, my analogy was good, and then you ruined it, Alex. I'm upset. Yeah, your analogy was pretty good, but, <sighs> but I think tackling someone is a better visual. <laughs> One of the things that I like about this is that uh, Mashable says a hacker known for targeting websites and apps was responsible for the breach. <laughs> exactly. Because who else? That's like, and it's like <laughs> saying 
a person who works at Uber was the person who picked up me in my Uber. Yes. Right. A person who is known to practice neurosurgery did my brain surgery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, you mean like, a oh. neurosurgeon. Oh, right. Right. A person who prepares <laughs> sandwiches for me was the person who made my sandwich for me at Subway. Yes, that makes a complete and total sense. I fully get behind that. Isn't it interesting that in this case, though, they decided to just disable accounts? I mean, usually yeah. these companies are. I mean, are I, just, I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not against it because I feel like a lot of people, they're not going to be. Uh, like, I don't know how many people return to the same place daily. You know what I mean? Like, usually what ends up happening for me, this is how I get my news, is I'll look up a topic and then I'll see all the news about it from all these different websites and I'll click through them. I don't know how many people come back to, like, Mashable. So if they make an account, it makes sense kind of for them to disable it because then people who forgot about that the fact that they had an account with mashable don't have to worry about it right and anyone who returns can can do something about it and finally ransomware spreading like cancer prevents necessary appointments the university of vermont health network is scrambling to recover its systems after a cyber attack led to delays in patient appointments it halted chemotherapy, mammogram, and screening appointments and led to 300 staff being furloughed or reassigned. The attack came through the hospital's main computer server and impacted its entire system. The FBI and Vermont National Guard have reviewed thousands of end-user computers and devices to ensure that they're free of malware. UVM Health Network has been vague about what data was accessed, but the scheduling of appointments has been impacted. The health network said that it's made significant progress to restore behind-the-scenes components that will help restore patient-facing systems. Another week, another ransomware. And this time, we're, we're back in the healthcare space. Mm-hmm. So, reminds me of the good old days where uh, when you wanted to make an appointment, they'd just whip out their desk calendar and pencil yeah, you in. And, and right behind them was thousands and thousands of patient files. <laughs> exactly. And big old file cabinets with uh, no locks or anything. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. Uh, that's way more secure than uh, through the internet, for sure. Well, in this case, it might seem that that's, the, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> in this case, I wonder, you know, it would be interesting to see if, like, University of Vermont Health Network had any problems with physical PHI in comparison to now or other healthcare facilities like I would love to see that just in general yeah right that would be an interesting interesting thing to do HIPAA violations now because back then I mean software companies and stuff that create cybersecurity solutions and stuff will tell you oh well no this is way better than physical but it's like is it (laughs) right (laughs) sometimes yeah now I should note that HIPAA wasn't put into place until 1996. Mm -hmm. So the data we have regarding potential, well, HIPAA violations wouldn't go back any further than 1996 because it simply didn't exist. Right. Um, Granted, I I think our electronic systems are relatively new in, in terms of healthcare, but we probably don't have good data for before HIPAA simply because it wasn't a HIPAA violation. Right. Well, yeah, it wasn't. And companies were actually asking. They would call up the doctors of people who were applying for their job and then asking for like their medical history (laughs) and then hiring them based upon that because of like health insurance reasons, Mm -hmm. which is kind of like nowadays it's like dystopian is what that sounds like. (laughs) It's like, holy cow. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Uh, companies still do things sort of like that, but a lot of the times it's just kind of on your your own recognizance. Mm-hmm. It's usually it's through Facebook and stuff like that. So, right, definitely not a a good thing to do, though. No, <laughs> not not very fair. That's it for this week's wrap up of your weekly healthcare news. I'm Alex Ross, and I'm Matt Moneypenny, and we will see you next week. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of The Bandage. This week's episode was written and produced by eTactics. eTactics is a leading revenue cycle solutions organization committed to providing innovative, web-based solutions that improve our clients' cash management and customer relationships. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.